Hello, everybody. I can't see you, but I can see you in my mind's eye. And it's good to be with you. And we're going to start a new series today. I don't know what you think about these masks that we have to wear. It's a bit of a nuisance. But, you know, we were in Costco the other day and we bumped into the Lone Ranger. And he said, I don't have any trouble with these masks. Uh, and then he told me that Car that Zorro was in the store as well, but he was lost in the crowd. I couldn't find him. Anyway, we'll persevere. And now we are ready to start our new series. And let us raise the curtain so we can find out what it is all about. Well, the new series is Restoration, the Nehemiah story. We're going to start with part one in a moment. But let's just get a little bit of background before we do so. First of all, we want to remind ourselves that God is in the restoration business. And this is demonstrated very well in a trilogy of books in the Old Testament. And these were all written during the exile when the people of God had been taken away to another place far from where they lived. And they were in, in uh, exile. These foreign kings used to like to do that. They would take a whole lot of people out of where they were felt comfortable into another place with, which were in which they were not comfortable. And so it kept them off balance and they would not revolt against their new captors. Well, that's what happened to the people of Israel. And these books were written then. First, there was the book of Ezra. And Ezra was actually a Jewish scribe and a priest. And he did something very significant. He reintroduced the Pentateuch to the people in Jerusalem. Now, you remember after, after these people, after the enemy had come over, they just flattened everything, knocked down the walls, burnt the gates, destroyed the temple, got rid of everything. And so these people had nothing. It's not like today when they, you could say, well, open your Bible to Genesis chapter 6 or something because they just didn't have them. And most of them couldn't read either. So he had this momentous task of reintroducing people to the Pentateuch. And then, of course, the book of Nehemiah follows that. And that's the one we'll be looking at a bit more closely. And then finally, Esther was the third one. She was the beauty queen who became the real queen. And did she do anything? Oh, yes, she certainly did. She saved her people from annihilation. There was a man called Haman who had the same ideas about Jews as Hitler did and tried to get rid of all of them. It didn't work then, and it certainly has never worked because those people are still back in their country. So God restores many different things. He's, he restored the altar. He restored the temple. He restored the houses, the walls. That's where we all come in. The worship and broken lives all through these three books. Then we got to notice that God implore, implores all kinds of people. He, we could call him actually an equal opportunity employer. Now, if I was God's HR person, human resources, I would say, you know, Lord, I've looked at some of these resumes and I would not use these people. And God says, I can use anybody that I want to use. He even used heathen monarchs. Maybe they didn't always know God was using them, but he certainly did use them. People like Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Well, Darius, you might know him better by the American translation or uh, way of saying his name, Dar Darius. And then Artaxerxes is a little known fact about him. He let his friends and his in, in a circle call him Art. So if you hear me talking about Art, you'll know it's Art Xerxes because he's the one that's in this chapter that we're going to be looking at. 
And then his enemies called him Art the Axer. Not a very pleasant person. And then God uses his chosen people. Now, they weren't all that eager to be chosen or to be used. They didn't mind the badge. I'm, I'm one of God's people, but they didn't always cooperate too well. You remember Jonah? He was a very good example. God told him to go east. So he jumped on a boat and went west as far as he could go and had a whale of a time getting back. And then, of course, there's Joshua. And some people may be thinking, wait a minute. Wasn't Joshua the guy that knocked down the walls of Jericho? And we're talking about building up walls. Well, actually, that was a different Joshua. Joshua was a priest who worked with Zerubbabel. I like that name, Zerubbabel, because it reminds me of rubble. And all the rubble they had to step over on their way to Jerusalem. And he led 42,000 Jews back from captivity. And then we have Haggai and Zechariah. And what they did was they helped restore the temple. And then we come to Ezra and Nehemiah. We'll be talking about Nehemiah's story soon. And then Mordechai and Esther that we, we just mentioned. And then everyday people God can use. Now our government has given me a very exalted title. I'm non-essential. People ask me, what do you do? Well, I'm non-essential. Well, God says, I don't care if you're non-essential. I can use you too. Isn't that great? So we'll see the following as we go through this book. We'll see that God can use heathen kings and everyday people to do extraordinary things. When we look at that word extraordinary, what does it mean? Well, when you think about it, obviously, it's just two words put together, ordinary and extra. And God says, I have a great deal for you. If you work with me, I'll let you do the ordinary thing and I'll do the extra. Now, another thing we're going to find out is doing something worthwhile brings opposition. And boy, oh boy, did Nehemiah have opposition. And the enemy is subtle, creative, and versatile. So you have to really be on your guard about this enemy. He's not just going to come raging in full tilt. He's got different ways of trying to stop you. And if one plan doesn't work or it fails, he tries another. He never gives up. The enemy never gave up until the war was finished. How do you like these new curtains? And they are introducing us to part one, the bad news. This is going to be a shorter part because of all the introduction that we did. So Nehemiah tells his own story. He says, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, or art, if you like, I, Nehemiah, was at the fortress of Susa. Now, I know what you're thinking. What is this fortress, and where is Susa, and what is Nehemiah doing there? Well, we can tell you that. Susa is in the Persian Empire, and it's modern-day Iran, actually the southern part of modern day Iran and Nehemiah was a captive in exile he had a very good job by the way he was the cupbearer to the king and very few people were given that job it was a job it was for somebody who was really trusted we'll come back to that so let's just have a look at the map and to see where they went well there's Israel and Jerusalem right on the coast of the Mediterranean, right on the west side of our picture. And you see that blue line that's going along across the page? Well, that is not a river. It's actually a road that people today can drive from Jerusalem to Iran. I wouldn't advise it, though, but... But the map people tell us that 
it would take you about 30 hours, 28 hours, somewhere there, depending on how long you stopped if you went there. But remember, in those days, they didn't have transport. They didn't have nice roads. And so they were forced to walk all that way, all those many miles to Iran or Persia. And then they were kept there as captives. And the idea was that when you take people away from their own country and put them in a foreign country, they get off balance and they've got new things to learn and they won't spend their time trying to escape or to uh, do something, uh, revolt against the king and they'll be a long, long way from home and s soon enough they will forget all about where they came from. That was the idea of the way that the kings did this. They had a something to learn about the people of Israel though they didn't forget and it was 1,500 miles at least so they were a long way from home and in those days they didn't have satellite news or TVs or radios they were just isolated and far away from where they came from and there were some prominent Jews that were in exile, that rose to promise, prominence in the actual countries in which they were living. Joseph was one of those who went to Egypt. Now, he wasn't taken away by military force, but as you remember, he was sold by his brothers to some slave traders. But Joseph started as a slave, ended up as the VP in his new country. Everybody had to bow down to him wherever he went. Now there were some people that were taken to Babylon. Daniel, for instance, was taken to Babylon and as a foreigner, as a, as a captive, he became an advisor to a number of kings. So one king was there, made him advisor. Another king took over and made him the advisor and so forth. And can you imagine in this country, the president of the United States, whoever he might be, asking somebody to be adv his advisor. Then when his term is over, another president comes, maybe of a different party, and says, I'm going to keep you on as my advisor. And then a third president comes along and says, yes, I like you so much, I'm going to keep you on. Very unheard of. But Daniel was such a trusted person and used by God in those circumstances that he, kept, he was kept on in different regimes. And then also in Babylon, we had the three men, Shad, Micha, and Abe, who were famous for being thrown into the fiery furnace. But we forget, too, that they had prominent places in the governance of Babylon, bestowed on them by the king, who really put a lot of stake in them. Now we have Esther and Mordechai who were sent away to Persia. They were exiled in the Persian, which is also a part of Iran, but modern Iran, but maybe the more northern part. And uh, uh, you can see that Mordechai was much taller than all the other. Oh, no, 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 he wasn't. He just had a longer name. But they did great things. And if we, took, we did that book of Esther uh, with the class uh, several years ago, and I tell you, if the person who wrote the book of Esther was a Hollywood scriptwriter, he would have got an Emmy for it because it's such a fantastic story with so many twists and turns of good and evil. Uh, you gotta, if you had, haven't read it, you've got to read it. And then we have Nehemiah also in the Persian Empire, which is modern day Iran, and he will find out what he had to do in just a moment. So now we're going to move on. And Nehemiah is visited by some friends who have come all the way from Jerusalem. It's a 1500 mile trip. Again, not on our modern convenience of, of getting from place to place. 
And you ask them the natural question, how are things in Jerusalem? He's hoping they'll just say, oh, fine. They say this, not going well, not at all. Well, what do you mean? Well, the people are in trouble and they're in disgrace and the walls are down and the gates are burned. Oh, it's just pathetic. Everywhere there is just mess and rubble and nothing has been done. Now, Nehemiah could have listened to all this and he could have thought something like this. Well, it's not my problem. It's like if we heard about something happening in China, maybe, uh, and, and somebody told you about the big earthquake, a lot of people were killed. You probably would, wouldn't actually use these words, but you might be thinking, well, that's terrible, but it's not my problem. Or we could have said, you know, I wish I could go and help them, but I'm a captive here. I can't just go waltzing off. I have a great job, but I'm still a captive. Or we could have thought, you know, I don't know what's the matter with these people. They've had 13 years to fix the wall and the gates, and I was hearing that it's still in a mess. 13 years. It could have got very uh, spiritual and said, I'll pray for them to get busy. Or he could have said, you know, God is judging them, which was true. God is judging them, and I am not going to get in the way of God's judgment. Or he could have said, this may be my, one of my favorites. I'm a cupbearer, not a contractor. See, his job in serving the king, one of the things he had to do was to get, hand the wine to the king. And if he suspected anything in the wine, he would take a sip of it first and then hand it to the king. And he had to have manicured hands to do that job. And if he went and picked up boulders and tried to fix the walls and clear up rubble, he would have rough hands, not very good for a job like that. So he could have said, I'm a cupbearer, not a contractor. And probably contractors wouldn't be good cupbearers and cupbearers wouldn't be good contractors. So that's my excuse for not being involved. Somebody should do something was his next thing that he could have thought. And you know, when you say somebody should do something, what you're really saying is nobody is going to do anything. So he could have thought any of those things, but we don't hear of him doing anything like that. So what would you have thought if you had been in his place and you'd got this news from far away. Well, I'll have to leave that for you to think about. So how did Nehemiah react? Well, he tells us, he said, I sat down and wept. Now we have to remember that these people, these Semitic people are much more used to showing their emotions than we are. We're very stoic. We just sit there and listen to a sermon or whatever it might be. We if we're at a, a ball game, we might cheer some, but nothing like them. They really knew how to express their emotions. And he said, I sat down and wept. Well, he could have done it just for a short while and then said, well, things, we have to move on, you know. Life has to keep going. But he says, for days I mourned and fasted. And he said, I prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed. That's a good idea. Now, just to get a feeling of how people felt, these Jews, as they were in Babylon, we read Psalm 137. Beside the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. For our captors demanded a song from us. 
our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Sing us one of the songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you, if I don't make Jerusalem my greatest joy. Wow, they certainly had great feelings toward Jerusalem. So as we close, why was Nehemiah so upset? God had given them this land. Jerusalem was the capital. That's where God's name was honored. Now they were unprotected, dilapidated, and God's chosen people were in great trouble and in disgrace. You see, God had blessed them for a purpose. He blessed them to be a blessing to others, but they were in disgrace, as the visitors told Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was concerned about two things. He was concerned about the physical walls and the people themselves. And they both needed restoration, which is our theme. So in closing, first Nehemiah was shocked, then he prayed, and next week we will look at Nehemiah's prayer. So here's your take-home box. We have three things to put in there. Care. Do you care? Despair. Are you in despair? Then make sure you go to prayer. That's the most important thing to remember. So let's put that away. And we'll look forward to next week when we'll discuss Nehemiah's prayer. So let's bring down the curtain to end this segment. And may God bless you. And may you have a great week.